Welcome to uh, the LGBTQ uh, comics and social activism panel for WonderCon. I'm really excited to have everyone here, some of my favorite people in the world. I'm really excited to get into this conversation. My name is Justin Hall. I'm a cartoonist. I've been working in comics since 2001, and I've been super gay the entire time, so I've been making <laughs> queer comics for the whole time. Um, and um, I, I'm a professor. I teach comics at the California College of the Arts in the MFA and Comics program. and um, done uh, history work around queer comics and uh, community building work, which we'll get into as well. But I'd um, like to introduce the rest of the panel here. Oh, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and let's uh, go on to the next person here. So Lawrence. Hi, my name is Lawrence Lindell, a cartoonist based in the Bay Area, but I'm from Southern California. Uh, I run a kind of archival collective project called The Baileys, based in the Bay Area for queer cartoonists and cartoonists of color. Um, and I run a small press in the Bay Area with my wife called La Neha House. And yeah, also queer, that's why I'm on the panel. But unlike Justin, I haven't been queer the whole time, or at least I wasn't open about it. So yeah. Uh, my name is Tara Madison Avery. I'm uh, the publisher of Stack Deck Press. I'm also a cartoonist and editor. Um, upcoming projects will include the Polyamory Coloring and Activity book and uh, uh, an art book based on a series of illustrations by Awan Mance, um, the 1001 Black Men series. I'm also working on a couple of projects of my own. I have um, a uh, series of stories called Marrier about the uh, intersections of polyamorousness, queerness, and other chaotic in, uh, influences in the Los Angeles area, and also um, a little bit about recent events called You Are Not Essential. Hi everyone, my name is Anand Vedawala. I'm a kindergarten teacher in San Francisco Unified School District. I'm also the executive director of San Francisco Zine Fest. That is how I know a lot of you. Um, and currently I live in Oakland with my partner and we, we've been here for a few months now though I've been in the Bay Area for over 10 years. And right now, a lot of my focus has been about writing about queer South Asians and writing picture books um, about people of color. I'm Jennifer Camper. I'm a cartoonist and my work deals with um, being queer, being female, being mixed Arab American. I also edit anthologies and I've organized countless queer comics events, including the Queers and Comics Conference. And I'm just thrilled to be here. Hi, I'm Trinidad Escobar. I am a cartoonist from Milpitas, California, um, but I was in Oakland for about 10 years and recently came back to do some work here um, based on Milpitas. So I'm working on little cornfields as like kind of my ongoing side project while I work on um, my bigger graphic novel of Sea and Venom. Uh, which is about decolonization and headhunters in the 1500s, South Pacific, and queerness in, um, in Asia. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you all. Um, heading to speaker mode now. So um, my, I, my first question, so, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach social, social activism while making comics, while making art in general. Um, one of the first things that uh, just occurs to me uh, with, with queer cartoonists in particular is this just the very fact of, uh, of existing is a sort of act of resistance uh, because we were meant to, to not exist uh, for, for the majority of, uh, of, of our history. Um, so I'm wondering about this idea of um, simply creating stories that are personal than being a sort of political act. There's the phrase personal is political, uh, which was popularized by Carol Hanisch in 1970. But um, she denies authorship of that of that phrase, and nobody has taken um, taken it on. Basically, it's sort of understood to be come out of the community organically, and it's it was used for uh, feminist uh, discourse for and still is to this day. And I, I just love the phrase; I think it's really wonderful. So I'm wondering if if you all could um, talk about this idea, the the personal being political, um, um, and how that might affect your work and show up in your work. I came up with that quote actually. <laughs> No, um, seriously, yeah. So when you're when you're queer, you know, you're basically sharing a, a variety of life, a way of living that um, that a, that a big portion, or perhaps ninety percent or greater uh, portion of the population is unfamiliar with, and they're in a position where they can uh, elect political representatives or or uh, or contribute or participate in in activism, contrary 
to queer goals and queer um, queer well-being. So yes, uh, by communicating to people who are not in the know about who we are, we are basically engaging engaged in the political act of uh, preserving our own well-being and um, and uh, promoting understanding. There is this thing about um, just existing and being visible that is very important. At least it has been for me, and I think a lot of queer folks can also identify with that, just being able to be someone who looks like you, who thinks like you, who maybe feels towards others the way you do. I remember when I first came out to my cousin, one of my cousins at age 18, her reaction was, I didn't think Indian people could be gay. And I was like, that's, <laughs> but it was true, it was true. And I didn't realize for the longest time that maybe, oh, me having feelings for another boy at the time in high school meant that maybe I was queer, maybe, I wasn't straight. And I think that was part of it because I never saw anyone who was queer and South Asian being portrayed in the media that I was consuming, whether I was seeing on TV or in the movies or being taught about in school. So yes, our existence <laughs> is very important and in a way it is political and it is revolutionary just to be visible and be alive right now. I agree with that. I feel like because we live in a culture where um, the media and the arts are so, in, we're so inundated with the media and the arts that it's really important for people to get validation. And when those of us who grow up without seeing ourselves in stories, in TV shows, in comics, it's, um, it's very missed. And like a lot of people, I drew comics to tell the stories that I wanted to read and that I wasn't finding out there. Um, I feel like our stories are not being told unless we do it ourselves. And so we're doing it almost for ourselves. We are our own first readers. And I think that's a really important part of making this kind of work. I just wanna um, um, add to the idea that like queer folks didn't exist in in certain cultures like in Asian cultures or um, in South South Asian uh, Southeast Asian um, cultures um, because queerness or being out is sometimes akin to being whitewashed westernized or Americanized um, that this idea of queerness came from this the influence of the West and, and imperialism and colonization uh, when um, uh, in the Philippines, which is a Catholic country, there's no research into queer histories. It's, it just doesn't exist. Um, and anything that comes out queer and is is trying to, you know, become canon and is is uh, um, trying to establish its place as legitimate is automatically seen as. Um, uh, Western and not of us, and that's really damaging to uh, Filipinos in the diaspora, um, Filipinos in America who um, are trying to find home in the Philippines and also try to establish this American identity. It it does a lot of breaking of the spirit when when you're told like nah your identity isn't real and didn't exist and what you're experiencing now is like this poison. Um, so uh, making of sea and venom, which takes place partially in the 1500s, um, I have to make up a lot of what I think queerness looks like, um, what it might've looked like based on certain cultures that exist, existed at the time. And I, I already feel the heat coming. I already feel like a lot of the, my, the activists and my own people coming for me because uh, it's gonna be, not, not that this huge wave is gonna come at me, like this book is this huge thing, but um, we don't have queer uh, graphic novels like on a larger scale in the Philippines. And, um, and this is going to be released in the Philippines as well. So I, I already feel some of the like pressure for myself uh, to, to um, get it right, but what is right right now, except to tell my my experience, um, do a little research and, and do the best that I can. So it's, it's deeply personal, deeply political. So uh, th uh, there's so many different uh, issues that come up with all those answers that I really wanted to uh, dig into. Um, 
Uh, one of the so uh, a, a few of, of you um, talked about the idea of representation and being really important be, uh, when you can sort of see yourself, right? I think about Alison Bechdel talking about when she uh, created Dykes to Watch Out for that she wanted to make lesbians visible, and that was her her goal. And and so many people, I think, so many queer people saw themselves reflected in the panels of her comics. And I think that's true for all of our work, you know, kind of moving forward. Um, but there's also, you know, representation is comp complicated, right? And there's even some pitfalls at times for it, um, with it. I think about Ramsey Fawaz talking about how uh, uh, that you can get too obsessed with sort of um, perfect representation that if you're always kind of waiting for yourself to be exactly mirrored, that's going to be, that's, you're, you're always going to be dissatisfied, right? And I think about my own, like, you know, I love the X-Men when I was when I was growing up, right? And um, uh, the the one sort of uh, gay character, uh, openly gay character that was presented to me late um, as Northstar, I was not interested in, but I was interested in Storm. Like she spoke to me, right? So um, how who you connect with, what kind of characters you connect with, or what stories you connect with might not match exactly the mirroring um, aspect. So if you guys could talk about maybe. Um, uh, what, how representation matters and also its sort of limitations. When we were growing up and a lot of the comics that we were reading didn't have any direct representation and even X-Men for the most part was a, was, was, was sort of very much a, a, a grand metaphor. You know, it wasn't, they, they never really came out and said it, although, you know, it was, you know, from 75 on, it was clear that the metaphor was, you know, the anti-queer, anti-queer hate, you know, and uh, what have you, but when when there's no representation, even bad representation is a step up. And I I I, I say this right now. And um, he's hardly uh, the the most sensitive and uh, you know uh, sensitive person with concerned with the greatest with, with the most no noblest social justice concerns. But um, Howard Shakin's presentation of every every in every a presentation of of gender gender nonconforming individuals in his books, they're always villains. They're always horrible people. Like there was the Nazi who was a cross dresser and, you know, but, but it was absolutely a drop, drop dead knockout. And, uh, you know, and, and just like, wow, that's fascinating. Am I in that? Or the, or the, or the, or, or the, or the, or the transgender vampire or wannabe in, uh, in Black Kiss or whatever. All these people were horrible people, but it's like, that's something in there. There's something in there that's about me or that I can connect with. And you get fascinated with, you look forward to the next, next, uh, next opportunity for him to tell that you, tell you you're a horrible person. So. And it's funny. I think growing up, not even queer representation, but just like, again, as a South Asian, there isn't much representation in, <laughs> in American media. So Apu, of course, on The Simpsons. Um, I remember my dad one time calling me out and saying like, why are you watching this? There are some offensive jokes in it that I thought he thought that he believed they were inappropriate. And my defense was, there's an Indian person on here. And I was like, that's why watching it. Look, there's one of us and, and he has a store. <laughs> like he has his own business. Look at, isn't that amazing? And of course now as an adult, I'm like, this person is very problematic. Also, he's not voiced by a South Asian person. And of course now as I've gotten older, I've learned much more about uh, all of that about Apu and how actually harmful his representation is and can be. But when you are an immigrant, uh, like I was when I first moved here, I mean, I still am, and you just want to see, you're amazed that there is a version of you on the screen. Um, and especially in American culture, where we are meant to see white male as the default, where every background, every race is, a, is supposed to identify with the representation. So I like with the white person and their feelings in movies and TV shows. So if we watch a movie with black characters, we're like, oh, that's a black film. But it's if you watch this with like Latinx characters, it's like, oh, that's that kind of film. But with the white character, main character, we're all supposed to just identify. It's like, of course you should be able to relate to this. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of uh, straight audiences have an issue when there's a queer character where they're like, how can I identify with this? That's not me. And I'm like, wait, I, as a person of color and as a queer person, I've identified with straight folks, with white folks, people who didn't look like me this whole time. I think you should also be able to do it. These are characterizations. Um, so, um, and, and I'm speaking of like queer South Asians, I, I can't remember any right now, <laughs> if there were any in, in media. One, one, uh, one thing that uh, Jen mentioned earlier about um, so, uh, that uh, queer comics being made by queer people for queer people sort of, uh, and it, it makes me um, 
uh, it brings up this question of who is your audience, right? And uh, Lawrence, one of the things that I find really remarkable about your comics is that they feel like both uh, authentic to your, obviously to your voice and sort of speaking to your own community, but also something that would be accessible to broader communities as well, like especially when you're talking about issues around mental health or queerness or, I mean, all, all these different uh, issues. So do you, what do you, how do you think of your audience? Like, do you think about kind of talking to your own community? Do you think about being able to sort of educate beyond that? Is that part of a social activism um, goal of your art? Yeah, um, usually I'm talking to myself first, um, especially regarding my uh, queer comics is usually kind of helping myself to accept this or acknowledging that I have a right to be queer because that was always my issue. It was like, when I'm by the person I'm in a relationship with, we look like a straight couple. Do I have a right to be queer? Do I have a right to talk about this queerness? Uh, what does that look like? How do I relate that to people that know I'm proud to be queer just because I don't look queer doesn't, you know, like, and what does queer look like? Um, and so it starts as this conversation that people are also having with themselves. I meet a lot of young black bi people at shows and they're kind of like, hey, that's me too. Or I grew up in the church too. And so I never think of myself as an activist more of I'm just kind of living my life and like you were saying earlier, it's like being yourself is a political act, which is ridiculous, but it is. Um, and so that's how I approach my work. And then I'm like, well, I see this is working. Maybe I can use this as a way to talk to my family. Maybe I can use this as a way to talk to my community because pictures work. It's not too hard to read. Um, I'm educated, but I don't have that vast of a vocabulary because I have my own, well, you know, you were <laughs> how I feel about English and the things that English has done to certain people and making us feel certain ways when we don't speak. You know, I have a lot of, yeah. So I'm like, well, I could write it in a way I know people understand and it's me. Like, I wish I had my comics when I was younger and then to realize that there were comics from people like me that just weren't promoted and I didn't have access to. So I'm trying to make sure that everyone has access to this information type of thing. Yeah, if that makes sense. Actually, that that leads me to a question uh, with with you know Jen was talking about the creation of the Queers and Comics Conference, and one of the things I I, I uh, a disclosure I, I I helped in some of those as well, but <laughs> but it was Jen's uh, Jen's brainchild, and um, one of the things that was such a sort of um, you know project goal I think for us was to create intergenerational. Um, uh, conversations and conversations between different, you know, building coalitions between different kinds of queer identities, different generations about, that look at queerness differently and queer identities differently. So, Jen, if you could talk about that, um, uh, that uh, goal for you, for your community building work in comics. Um, I, there's so much to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So basically. Um, Queers and Comics Conference, and, and really all the uh, community events that I've organized have been just because I wanted to get a bunch of cartoonists together and have a party. And I needed a way to have that happen. And by couching it in some sort of event, you know, it would bring us all together in a room. Um, and so the conference was a way to get hundreds of LGBTQ cartoonists together for a few days and you know we had all these panels but like in comics it's what happens between the panels that to me is the most exciting and I wanted people to meet other people that they didn't know see the friends they did know get inspired realize who has been inspired by their work and like Justin was saying I wanted to get people of different generations to interact and to be influenced by each other. And, you know, we had a lot of good parties. Uh, uh, Lawrence, I do remember you talking about uh, it was inspirational for you to, to meet uh, someone like Rupert Kennard, who had been doing uh, work by, you know, out, uh, about out Black characters, you know, from their 1970s. Yeah, it was, um, that's kind of what I was talking about. Uh, it's just like, even though he's gay and I'm bi, it's still like, you know, that would have helped me be like, oh, I can do this. It's okay. Like, there's a space for me here. And then also there's space to talk about my personal experience with queerness. And he opened that door. But then 
how am I a black cartoonist and I don't have access to this information that this stuff exists? And I'm, I got my master's. Like, if it wasn't for certain teachers putting that in the classroom, I, I would have just been out there like, well, it's just me. Like, <laughs> like I'm, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, yeah, that Queers and Comics was is very important. Uh, it was, it was very important to be able to meet him. Um, so you, it it worked in like what you set out to accomplish you really did accomplish because now I get to take Rupert and bring him back to a whole sea of black kids they're like what 1970 you could be queer in 1970 which we don't talk about James Baldwin Audrey Lord like there's all these queer heroes we have that are kind of not once they become something else to someone else the queerness kind of goes away <laughs> and it's like well they're just black and it's like no they're black and they're queer because I'm black and I'm queer so you can't just erase that and yeah it's a tangent but that's what comics I'm trying to accomplish like hey please hear my voice please hear our voice uh we have stories to tell that include all this type of blackness that includes queerness because it's always overlapped and yeah so <laughs> one of the things also I was thinking um uh, about this sort of generational stuff and um, and then how do we talk about different uh, generations experiences and you know Trinidad you're doing historical comics that deal with queerness um, I just did a, a series of um, historical pieces about queer San Francisco and one of the things is that uh, you, you were alluding to this earlier that identities sort of shift and the way we talk about them shifts language shifts and how to um, how to, uh, to get that into a comic is really uh, complicated, right? Um, you're dealing with both words and images. Um, uh, one of, for example, one of the terms that um, a lot of gender nonconforming folks and trans people back in the '60s would use in San Francisco was uh, a hair fairy. I, had you know, I'd never heard that term until I, like, you know, until I discovered it, right? Uh, kind of doing this research. But how does that then translate? I can't just use that term when I'm when I'm doing a sort of modern comic. So. Uh, how, Trinidad, how do you deal with that stuff? And I also want to hear from Tara about this too, because you do a lot of historical work. Um, how do you both sort of deal with the changing language uh, around queer identities when you're doing historical work? Oh, that's such a big question, Justin. <laughs> I only ask big questions. <laughs> I have coffee sweats. Um, like, uh, okay, so just to take some of that and, and step back a little bit, um, I'm careful about um, making clear that of sea and venom is inspired by history and is uh, not a historical comic only because I put so much fantasy into it because I see fantasy as like technology for decolonization, right? I don't have a real connection to the motherland. I wasn't raised there. Even folks who are raised there don't necessarily have any ties to indigeneity anymore, you know? So um, I'm completely removed. And um, this was my entryway into imagining with the material that's available. So um, it is inspired by history. I have no idea what kinds of words were used back then to, to describe uh, people, to describe a queer experience. Uh, what I do know is that some words have survived uh, over the centuries and weren't, you know, changed into Spanish or Anglicized. So um, those few words give us um, insight as to how people think or how um, the psychology of a people was back then. Um, so what I can gather is that there that polyamory existed, that uh, trans identities and non-binary identities were um, third, fourth, and fifth genders, um, and that um, sex did not uh, equate to uh, romance or marriage, that uh, women and um, femme people were allowed to have sex with other people that um, they weren't necessarily going to marry. And they were um, made to, not made, they were raised to copulate and reproduce, right? But that didn't mean that they had to marry um, someone um, based on gender or, or, or sex, right? Uh, so there's a lot of like really big information that, that I get to work with. Um, and then in that creation, I get to make up the words. Um, and I have only recently gave, given myself permission to do that. I felt so scared, like, I need to find the right words. I need to make sure that my great, great, great ancestors are represented well. I need to make sure that I don't disappoint 
the historians back you know at the museums in the Philippines I'm like thinking real big about myself in this way right but really the story is so small it's 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 a uh, I'd rather explore the truth of what it feels like to really search for that element of identity rather than let me show you how to get it right because I don't know how to get it right. Um, so I'm okay stumbling in front of people through my books right now um, and in, in doing so creating some language that we can use. Yeah, that's the, the language is, is fascinating because a lot of the terms that we're very comfortable with today didn't exist. 40, 50, 100 years ago. So when you're looking for looking through the looking through the past for people who you, you might uh, find instructive or ins inspirational for a polyamorous experience, a trans experience, etc., um, you're going to be you're going to you're going to come up short because they're just you know they just you just they just didn't understand it that way then. And you know the the question always is is you know is this sort of the strong version of the superior warp hypothesis? It doesn't work until you put a name on it and Delimit, you know, delimit it from other things. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think that it really is you find examples as you said of, of polyamory, of queerness, of, of uh, gender nonconformity and trans experience, but um, they just didn't call it that thing. Um, where the language influence may come in is that it might not sort of be plugged into a, a system of connotations where it's deemed pejorative. Um, but uh, just in terms of history and seeking out things, the, you know, I make the, um, the historical LGBTQ coloring books and the polyamory book is sort of the next entry in that. And um, the the thing is is to sort of um, you know plunge into the past and find some sort of for for my purposes anyway, not for everybody's purposes, is to find high profile individuals, people we know that have had some sort of influence on our lives, that um, and that also represent different segments of the of the community, um, you know, in terms of uh, orientation and ethnicity. Um, that you can sort of bring to light and say this person um, is, you know, an example of of, of, of this phenomenon today. Um, in the trans hero, transgender heroes coloring book, I included perhaps not a hero, but a historical figure, um, Elagabalus, who was uh, one of the, the one of the most spectacularly incompetent Roman emperors we ever had, but um, was also perhaps you know the only. The only real reigning Roman empress, uh, the, by by today's standards, if you uh, were to, to to look at Elagabalus, um, you, know, uh, you would you, this would this is the woman a woman of trans experience, but has to uh, you know lead a religion and a, and, a, and an empire in a male role, and is is not is not taking that second part very seriously at all. So, um, of course, uh, assassinated before the age of eighteen, and the empire moved on. But but you know. But we do know now that hey, you know, we can rise rise to the highest levels of power, as long as we don't, uh, you know, run afoul of any any uh, any knives. Um, uh, Anand, you um, also you uh, illustrated a book um, about a sort of a fictionalized history of a black family in the United States. Um, so that also obviously is about uh, doing this sort of historical research and trying to figure out. But it's you know specifically from the visual side of it. So. Um, uh, talk to us about that. Like, how did you think about history and in, in, in a visual context? Part of that actually came about because of just all that was happening in 2014, 2015 in, in our country, just all the violence that we were seeing now like filmed and completely still ignored that was being acted upon the black community. And a, a friend of mine, another friend named Lawrence, <laughs> who now lives in Southern California. Uh, and he and I, well, we had both gone to Academy of Art University and we said, well, we talk about there not being works about people of color by people of color. We both went to school for this. <laughs> we can write this, we can say, we can put this out and we need to say something because this has been happening for centuries and it continues even now. And it's frustrating. We need to somehow get this out. Um, and at the same time, we had seen um, an infographic about children's books that was about like how many characters are of color and how many characters are white and all of that. And at the time, I think the statistic we had seen, the infographic we had seen was from 2012, where it was like 91% are white characters. And I'm like, that's, that's not okay. Um, so we decided to write the book and I had read this book, Spoon River Anthology, which came out in 1915. 
in high school, we were made to read it. And I loved it because it was fictionalized, but it's from the perspective of the townspeople. And it's little prose poetry like that you read a page of. And then through it, you find out about the secrets of the town, the gossiping and all that, what actually happened from the, and it's all from the perspective of the townspeople after they've passed away. It's their epitaphs that they, they, they themselves had written. Uh, so we took a similar approach and decided to illustrate it and to kind of highlight the injustices that the black community has been experience, experiencing like for let's say uh, just the past hundred years. So we went from 1915 to 2015 it ended up being, of course, a lot of research because we're trying to fit 100 years into a short little book that we wanted to get out within three months, which hindsight, not a great idea when you're doing that. <laughs> um, and part of it was just learning, just finding out about lots of things. Like, for example, like finding out like then back in 2015 that, oh, Portland, like Oregon was founded as a white utopia, um, that it wasn't meant to have any black people in it. So then when they finally opened uh, the borders and people went in, they did not experience <laughs> safety or anything as you would expect. Um, and part of it was also how, as a non-Black writer, I'm South Asian. So then as Lawrence and I were co-writing this, I told him, I'm like, Lawrence, you have to be a part of this project, first of all. Like we have to write this together. And he did all the illustrations for it and came up with this concept for it. But it was also, do I, how do I represent this accurately? How do I make it respectful? Because I'm someone who is not part of the community now writing about the community. Um, and we had some characters who talked about uh, being kids of slaves. And it was like, how do we approach the language? And I think part of it was just like, nope, I'm just gonna write it as I would um, if it was a person talking about themselves now, but the things they are talking about are a little bit different. Um, and at the end, it was, a, it was about a family surviving and persevering. Um, and part of that name was a hundred years from now, or I mean, the name is a hundred years from now, our bones will be different. And that was also intentional because we want to say, well, our bones will be different because they will have experienced so much. The world is still going to be a terrible place. <laughs> Unfortunately, we weren't very optimistic. That's the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it does seem like, um, uh, I mean, there's dealing with historical comics, uh, you know, you, there's sort of two things happening at once. Like on, on the one hand, um, you, you have to remain true to the actual brutality of the past and to the actual, you know, systems of oppression and, and the language that was used and, and to a certain extent that, you know, to keep people down and, we, you know, weaponized language and all this sort of, all the different weapons that oppression, you know, uh, um, um, th that oppressors were able to use on, on marginalized people um, throughout history, but at the same time also give those people agency, right? So that, um, uh, you know, there, there have always been, there's always been resistance. There's always been, you know, people sort of um, uh, fighting back against these, these systems of oppression. And we also have to pay homage to that in a real way. So it's sort of, a, for me, at least dealing with historical comics, there's like, you've got to be truthful about how horrible it was, but then also about how powerful the resistance, resistance actually was. We don't want to take away agency from, the, from our ancestors, right? Um, um, one of the things I was also thinking about, um, uh, da, 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 um, uh, there's other, uh, there's more, um, uh, you're, you're talking about sort of almost like a magical realism sort of construct here, right? Where you're, where you're doing these sort of epitaphs of, of this family as a way to construct their, their story. And, um, and Trinidad had also mentioned earlier about how um, she's been using um, uh, uh, elements of magical realism and horror, I know in your comics as well. So I'm wondering about how you bring, uh, how some of you as creators bring genre um, uh, concerns into your work, right? Jen has done a lot of this horror work as well and, and humor, of course, as well. Like how do you bring in, besides just being sort of like memoir comics and straight up personal as political, how do you bring in other genres to help construct um, a, a social agenda in your work? I think we're all looking for a community and a tribe. And, you know, for myself, when I looked at work by women, I find that most of the stuff is very heterosexual. And then I would look at the queer stuff and it would be very white. And then I would try and find Arabs and either they were, you know, villains or 
non-existent. Um, and so in a way, the idea that there's queer female who are mongrel Arab American and have that perspective, which is mine, is almost like magical realism in a way. It's it's like I'm creating this world that has my values and my perspective, and I'm positing it that as normal for the reader. And then I can throw that into any kind of story I want. So I can do a horror story, but from my perspective, or I can do a romance, but from my perspective. And um, you know, and it's just given that yes, there's queers and there's queers of color and there's transgender people and there's you know this whole world that's the world that I live in and my perspective. And then I just sort of fold that over, you know, hopefully good storytelling. And I force the reader to live in my mind in a way. And and I think that's the power of storytelling and the power of comics is that you make the reader look at the world through your own vision. And, and that's, you know, the power of art and how art can be a really um, constant force for change. I'll just add uh, really quickly that um, like when I um, you know, do all my journaling and I try to just get a lot of stuff out, I come to realize like, um, that very often my initial um, way of entering a story is like structuring it and being very like, I'm going to plot things out. I'm going to plug things in. And it's like real gross and boring. And the good stuff comes after you get all that out of the way. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to try to be a good Filipino horror writer. There's so many of us. There's like, it's everything, right? And so I'm like, what do my favorite Filipino authors do? They take elements that are naturally horrific from their lives and then build on that. And so uh, something that I kind of went um, over in my head when I made a comic called Casey and Juliet, which is about a queer Aswang or a vampire that uh, appears after a meetup. So back in the 90s for Filipinos, like people were down. They didn't say like, I'm gay, I'm bi they, in the Bay Area. It was I'm down, like D-O-N-E. Uh, and um, that was like code for I'm, I'm queer. But there was always a risk, right? So like, we all know that like <laughs> that fear of like, I don't know if this person is queer or not. I don't know how this is gonna really uh, go down. And so upon meeting someone, instead of that fear being, am I gonna get jumped? Is someone gonna hurt me? Now you get to be scared about other things. You're gonna be scared about whether or not this thing is gonna turn into a vampire. Um, Cause I feel like our fears um, valid and real and scary have been shown for all the world to see. And I'd like to see us be able to be scared of other things. So um, I, I take that element and, and think about like, what, what would be the scariest thing besides getting hurt back then, um, what would be the scariest freaking thing? Oh, if I hooked up with some like, like hella fine, like player, and I think things are gonna go good and, and something goes down. So yeah, that's just a, an example of how I might approach um, uh, genre. Great Trinidad, now it feels like you're not afraid of enough things, please be afraid of more things. <laughs> that is what you're doing. Well, you know, regarding genre for my own, for my own, so I, I missed my opportunity about what ten or thirteen years ago to be one of the the fat white but white ladies who writes uh, vampire novels and get becomes a millionaire from them. I could have been I could have been the trans Stephanie Meyer or Anne Rice. Um, Anne Rice isn't even fat anymore, so she she can't write any vampire novels either. But um, seriously, I think that the 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 powerful thing about commercial genres we talk about you know like horror, um, detective, romantic comedy, superhero, whatever, is that there's usually you know, we, they're all the traditional literary theory says, well, these are commercial genres, they come with their own rules and people can't do creative work within them. They can only work within, you know, mechanized, mechanized guidelines to create product for, that's not true. I mean, what, what, these, what these genres are often very good at doing is identifying conflicts in the world and sort of putting them in motion, you know, in some sort of, um, you know, metaphorical or, or, um, or, or allegorical mode. And, um, you know, and you look at, um, and, and 
And putting queer folks in these things often changes the people's understanding of them. So, um, you know, a, a queer romantic comedy isn't simply just a romantic comedy with queer characters in it. It can also, you know, in you know, it bring on bring into into play conflicts that don't exist in straight relationships. You know, being out. You know, uh, finding community. Um, things like that. Um, uh, like a queer superhero. You know, you know, the whole notion of a secret identity takes on a double meaning if you have a queer superhero. Um, where orientation is a is a danger, um, uh, and also moral responsibility is another superhero thing. You know, the, the, the quote. You know, the of course, you know, you have the genres of elimination and the genres of communion, etc. But, but yeah, I think that um, that genre can be exploited to great extent um, to uh, describe the queer experience in ways that uh, also are proven to entertain. Yeah, it's like not just queering characters, but queering genre itself, which is really amazing. I wanted to add, wait, I wanted to add just two things about that. And that one, I think a lot of us come from a self-publishing background. And I think because of that, we all have the freedom to explore and blend genres as much as we want. And that has been really helpful in helping us well blend whatever we want. <laughs> and I and the second thing I want to say is that I think a lot of times, especially for folks who are coming to terms with their identities or exploring their identities, uh, especially in my case, I feel like there is so much trauma and experience that I need to unpack that I kind of buffer it with humor or with another layer genre that just helps me talk about the trauma itself. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, another uh, sort of comic, um, a social activism comic I want to uh, touch upon is this idea of sort of um, uh, maybe applied comics, however you want to talk about it, but basically comics with a specific um, purpose, right? So um, I did recently a, uh, a, a public health comic. I was hired by a public health organization to do some comics around queer health. Um, and uh, I know some of you have done this sort of thing. Like uh, it could be anything from like doing, you know, murals, uh, comics murals um, for specific purposes or uh, working with um, uh, specific uh, nonprofit organizations or uh, activism groups. So I was wondering if some of you could talk about that experience as opposed to the sort of more self-expressive creative work that you do as well. Comics are a really powerful tool because I think people come to comics with their defenses down um, because it's words and pictures and, and people have this you know, memory of comics from childhood, or they think that they're going to be funny, or it's somehow thought of as as an easy art form, a very accessible art form. Um, you can pack in some really powerful messages that people will be sometimes more open to in a comics format. That said, there's also the problem of something that would be written somehow becomes more. Um, more powerful when it's drawn. And so some, some ideas become, you know, really scary to people when they see it in a picture format as opposed to just simply words. So I think comics are this, you know, really interesting tool as when used as a way to communicate complicated, sometimes dangerous ideas. And I mean, I think we all um, struggle with how to do that effectively and, you know, so sometimes the reactions, the negative reactions are just as satisfying to me because I feel like I've struck a chord. If someone's getting mad at my comics, then you know maybe I've done my job. And when we're talking about applied comics, comics have like a, 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 the advantage of images, you know, like uh, I mean, when we think about like, like an instruction manual to put together a piece of furniture or something, that's basically a comic, you know, sort of that, you know, imagine, you know, you know, you could, if you had to, like, had a prose booklet to tell you how to assemble a couch, you'd be, it'd be a nightmare, you know, and so the images have the power to do things, to, to, to directly, directly demonstrate something that words can only sort of talk around, you know, and it's sort of a, and I think that that's, um, you know, true with, you know, with, um, you know, showing people, you know, sharing, sharing people's lives, sharing details about people's lives as well, that is something that can be instructive, where, you know, um, my favorite thought experiment is like the difference between prose and English is like, um, as you say, um, here is a here's a sentence. Jill gave James an ironic look. Now, write write your own version of that sentence. And then then okay. Now Jill gave James an ironic look. Draw it. You know which 
which tells you more, which requires more work. And I think it's probably number two, but it does give you more of a, a more accurate picture of what's going on. And um, I think that's the instructive power, both in technical and personal matters. I wanted to actually um, uh, wrap up with, um, uh, and thank you, this has been a fantastic conversation. I could talk to you all for like five hours easily. So, um, but, um, I, but I wanted to also talk about community building and we've uh, touched upon it a, a few other times. Uh, Jen was talking about the Careers and Commerce Conference and other uh, community work she's done and um, uh, Lawrence with Linnea House and uh, Anand with, um, uh, Anand with um, uh, Zine Fest and uh, Tara with, uh, uh, Stack, Deck, Stack Deck Press, and um, can you talk about sort of like how you think about building community through comics and and um, um, pursuing a social um, activism through that sort of community building? My goal right now is to try not to repeat myself too much because there's always more stuff going on. You know, I, um, there's all there's always more more of a community to represent and to actively uh, push for the new thing. And you know, we're living in a time right now where everybody's lives are changing and that means queers lives are changing too and uh you know we're you know we we need to uh seek out you know the new the new challenges we have the new ways of living you know as um trinidad has said you know we don't have to worry about getting beat up quite as much as we used to although we still do um but um but uh but but you know life presents other challenges with us you know um you know with respectability comes respectable problems and so um I think that um, you know, building on what has come before, and uh, and uh, and and just sort of mapping out our own future with our work. What you just said was like my whole purpose of starting the Baileys was to build on what came before instead of being like, all right, it's my time. Where the Baileys is the, it, that that's not good for anything. I'm just building on what Chris and Comics was already doing, like. I want it to be a direct connection to what everyone on the panel right now is doing. It's like, I'm a part of that, not I'm separate from it. It's like, this is the reason I get to do this. And maybe the, I'll be the reason someone else gets to do that. And then the history is so important because knowledge really, like it's corny, but it's like knowledge is power, but it really is. Like um, having access to these things changes people's lives more than most people know. And I'm not talking about comics. I mean, just regular, people which I think we're regular too but we just happen to be able to draw but like regular people it's changing things in ways that people don't know what's happening and I see firsthand of what that little comic did for some little black kid that now doesn't have to wonder like is it okay for me to be here still wondering like it's 2021 and they're still wondering am I okay to be here so it's like that's the purpose of I want to give roses and then I want to bring I don't know. I just want people to feel like I can be here <laughs> still. It's still what the main thing is I'm focusing on. And it's not, you're human, you can be here because you're human, but you're human. And also people have laid the work that they tried to kind of erase that you don't even know people fought for you to, yeah, I just want to give access back. So community, that's community to me, um, connecting everyone outside of comics because comics is tricky, which I'm learning is like some stuff I don't understand and I don't know how to navigate that because I'm just like, hey, don't do that. We don't do that. And then it's like, well, this is comics. And it's like, no, that's, so I'm, I'm figuring that out. So I'm trying to continue that kind of DIY punk underground zine of we don't need the permission, we never needed it. And people are here that been saying that since the beginning, how do we get back to that type of thing? What Lauren said was so important that we have a responsibility because somebody paved the way for us. And I'm only able to do what I'm able to do because somebody else broke ground. And uh, so it's my responsibility to break ground for the next person through the door. And I feel like in some ways we all are, are small level gatekeepers and wherever we have the chance to bring other people along with us, it's, um, it's not only important, it's just a joy to do. One of the things like to add to what Jen and Lawrence also said, it's like one of the joys of running San Francisco Zine Fest, just having now the platform, the opportunity to provide a space for people to then tell their own stories. 
because it could just be me and the other four organizers like, you know what, let's just make it about us, no one else. It wouldn't be that great. I don't think 5,000 people would attend that. But the joy is in seeing so many amazing artists from all sorts of different backgrounds, like telling their stories, sharing their work and inspiring the thousands of people who come through those doors. I wouldn't have met, so I, <laughs> growing up, you see a representation of queer folks in one way especially in like new media and you're like, okay, this is all there is. But then you actually meet like kindred spirits <laughs> at festivals, at comic cons, at scene fest, all sorts of expos. Uh, and that helps us build community. I mean, that really does. Um, and I'm thankful I get to continue that forward and help other people create that space for others as well. I just wanted to add that um, because of, of Queers and Comics and um, all the other really amazing um, festivals and comic book festivals, um, I've been able to connect with people that I don't think I would have ever met. So something interesting that has happened is um, uh, with some of the the like journalistic comics I've put out there, I've gotten you know feedback and people coming to talk to me at these cons in person, um, and I'll hear you know like I never heard of anything like this before. I've never read anything like this before, and it made me feel seen, or like you didn't do a good enough job. So I'll get one of those. But one of the <laughs> one of the uh, really miraculous things that has happened is. I met two family members that I'd never met before. We didn't know that we were family. So, uh, and you know, a lot of fam uh, POC families, we have huge families. And my mom's side alone, just my adoptive mom's side, I have 60 cousins just on that side. And so I was like, one day I'm gonna meet more of them. And I don't know how. And so something that happened was um, a professor uh, directed someone to my table at San Francisco Zine Fest and was like, this person's working on their PhD, they're confronting some queer issues in their own families and they'd like to talk to you. And I got to talk to them. We found out we're first cousins that we never met and we're talking about the same, we're talking about the same family. That's magic, man, I love comics. So it's, it's healing and it's, it's hard work and I couldn't do any of this without community. I can't think of a better place to leave it. <laughs> Can I also say I love comics and I love our community and I love all of you. You were like my heroes and my role models and I'm just so like, you know, I'm internally grateful that we have this amazing community. So thank you all for, for doing this and for talking so openly and um, passionately about your work. Um, <laughs> bye folks. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. All right. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Uh.